Okay, great. So, hi guys, I'm Ryan. I'm the organizer for the Apex Skill Series. Um, many of you know that, just if you don't know that. Um, so, just in general, to put down some ground rules, right? We're all respectful here. And for the next hour, it's Charlotte's room. And so, Charlotte is an assistant professor in the department. She's going to be presenting networking for the job market and beyond. Um, she's an assistant professor in the applied economics department as of 2022. She earned her PhD at UC Davis with research focused on nutrition and food policy. And she has presented at and networked through several nationally recognized conferences such as AAEA, SEA, WEAI, and AERE. Um, she has found clearly recent success on the job market, so she is well positioned to provide us some tools about networking and how to succeed on the job market. So let's welcome Charlotte. Hello, everyone. Thanks for showing up today. Um, I am going to ask just preemptively that group of five to uh, break up because we're going to do a group activity and I think it's going to be a lot for five people to be in a group. Um, okay, so this is networking for the job market and beyond. So let's think about what that is going to. I'm not mostly going to lecture so you can see sort of a general outline here. So we're going to just cover some like quickly, five, ten minutes, general principles of networking. Then we'll have round one of Q&A to get your sort of preliminary questions out of the way. And then we're going to start basically doing some like practicing, getting comfortable of like introducing yourself to a group of people in a social situation. And if you are on the job market, so we have a mix of people who are at different stages from like first year to current job market candidates. Um, so if you're on the job market, you've already heard about the spiel. If you are in your first year, we'll talk about what it is. If you haven't written this yet, we'll have some time to draft it. And then we'll practice giving your little research spiel about yourself to other people. And then we'll have a round two of Q&A. So networking for the job market and beyond. We're going to start with thinking about the job market and then also spend some time thinking about the beyond. So beyond is either before or after. So for the job market, what does networking look like? So pre-job market, on the job market, and then post-job market. So pre-job market, for the most part, this is going to be like you're in a conference. Um, and how do you network at conferences? So conferences can be big and overwhelming, right? If you think about AAEA, it has more than 1,000 people, sometimes it's like 2,000 people attending every year. That is obviously more people than you can meet and make know you. The objective is not to make everyone at the conference know you. It's to think about who's there that you want to know you. So networking generally is about raising your profile and establishing a group of people that are sort of aware of who you are, what kind of research you do, and who are willing to help you, and for, you know, sort of mutually, that you are willing to help as well. So it's the set of people that you're going to be throughout your career exchanging ideas with. Um, you might send drafts back and forth to each other. Um, it could be some sort of like professional skill building where you know they have the ability to make fancy GitHub resources or they have the sort of technical skills that Thomas have and I don't have those skills so it's like helpful to me to have Thomas in my network. Um, but then also at some point there is probably something that I can do that is not in your skill set and so we can have this productive exchange, right? This is all of our comparative advantage. The network is about building a set of people who are in your network where you sort of cover all of the areas of comparative advantage. So when you go to a conference, think about, you know, sort of who are a few people that you would like to know. Maybe they have different comparative advantage to you. They're a different seniority in the profession. Um, and target those people. So you can send cold emails. So one thing that it could be useful to do is to sort of draft a cold email format that you could use for asking someone to get coffee at a conference with you. Um, the people in your session are your friends because they have similar research areas to you. So the sort of like 
example story that I tell of this is the first conference that I, hmm, not the first, one of the first conferences that I ever went to like on my own where my advisor wasn't also there. Um, that was a little scary because sometimes you just follow your advisor around. Like this is very common that you go to the networking session at AAEA uh, or the like open drinks reception thing and the advisor has their student with them and the student is just following around attached to the hip to their advisor like this. And that's like a very good model and that happens for a reason because it's like relatively successful, right? The advisor knows people and can introduce them. They're all in the same sort of network because they have shared research. If you're going on your own, you cannot do this with your advisor. Um, so then the people in your session are your friends. So I still keep in touch with one of the people who was in my like first ever session at my first conference that I went to by myself because I decided he was my person that I was gonna like attach myself to and we have pretty common um, shared research interests and we're at similar -ish stages of the PhD. Um, the relationship building doesn't end when the conference ends. So I think one thing that uh, helps you stand out and helps to keep the relationship going is you can exchange emails with people and I think you should definitely send thank you emails if you have a coffee with anyone. If anyone gives you feedback on your paper, find out their name and their email and send them a thank you and follow up after the conference. So the like day after you get back when you're too kind of tired and brain fried to do any real work is a great day to just set aside for who are the people that I talk to, send them thank you emails, all this sort of thing. Um, and then don't be afraid of self-promotion. I'm just gonna say self-promote. So social awareness is key and is maybe not a lot of academic strong suits, but think about you know, the like level of self-promotion that is appropriate for the venue that you're at. Um, and don't go too hard, but also don't be afraid to say, oh, hey, I have a paper that looks at this thing that you made a comment about in the session, or I'm working on this, or I'm thinking about this, and get people to know sort of your work that way. Um, so that sort of pre-job market, it's very heavily focused on conferences. And when I say conferences, I largely mean AAEA or APAM or the like big field-wide conferences that, um, that you often go to the summer before summer or fall before you go on the job market. So the main sort of networking activity while you're on the job market will be your interview. So that's both the short interview and the long, the longer like fly out day long interview. So main tip here is to know who you're interviewing with. This is a lot more feasible for the fly out than it is for the short interview. Um, but I would still recommend um, so you know on the fly out you can google the name of all of the people you get an itinerary and you can google the names of all of the people who are on your itinerary and sort of look at what kind of research they do and um, be a real creeper and find out things about them and think about what you would want to talk to them about because preparation might help you feel a little bit less nervous if you have a couple of things in your back, park, back pocket that you could chat with people about. Um, and that could be, you know, you don't want to seem like too much of a stalker, but if it's non-work stuff, that is sometimes fair game in certain situations of the fly out too, especially like the dinner or lunch because um, meal times are often times for non-work non chat as well as work chat. Um, in the short interview, you won't necessarily know who's going to be interviewing you beforehand. You should still know who's in the department or organization that you are interviewing with. Um, so if it's like a branch of the Economic Research Service, right, you know what branch and what division you're interviewing for a job for. So you could look up the people who are in that organization and say, oh, you know, these are people whose work I align with or that I would be excited to work with. Um, so just know sort of who you are, know who you are interviewing with and recognize that they are people too and that, you know, they're looking for a colleague, someone who is nice to be around and that they are excited to have in their department um, or organization as much as you are interviewing with them for your productivity or whatever. 
Um, I think another useful thing, people like when they feel like you are asking for their advice or taking whatever you, they say seriously. So I think taking notes is um, a sort of good way to signal that you are paying attention to what people are saying and it will come salient in the post job market um, strategic plan here. And then similarly, um, I'm going to repeat myself because I think it's important and you need to send thank yous. So that is for the short interview and the fly out as well. Um, no, it's not gonna be absolutely everyone that you talk to at the flyout because that's a very long list of people, but definitely the like key people that you met with one-on-one met with -on -one and the met members of the search committee as well on the flyout. Can you send a separate email to each or like one? A separate email to each. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot. Cool. The job market is like kind of a, your full-time job for the year and this is why. Um, So I'm going to say that interviewing is a different skill from networking, so I'm not going to talk about interviewing skills, but I think the like general make yourself seem like a nice colleague, have something to say. You want to be able to talk about your work and your productivity, but you also want to like give off an energy that you would be a person who contributes to the department. So, uh, yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So before uh, you get the short interview, how do you know that uh, which um, universities or which organization have that position, a uh, vacant position? Um, so there will be a lot of anyone who is on my listserv right now. I apologize for the quantity of emails that you are getting, um, but there are circulated through um, listservs, through the professional organization. So the um, Committee on the Status of Women in Applied Economics, uh, Cosbay, um, your network of uh, like the food safety and nutrition section is my section within AAEA that I am on. But if you're in the econometric section or the trade section or the like production section, they all have listservs. And if there's a job posting that is salient, that will get, or even not salient, it will get sent out through those listservs. And then you can also look at um, Joe, Job Openings for Economists. Um, which is like a bulletin board, basically, of all of the job postings. The AAEA also maintains a bulletin board. Um, and then there's USA Jobs for Government Jobs, if that's relevant for you. So there's like a lot of places that job postings are listed. And when you go on the market, there will be a placement coordinator who will hold a session that will communicate all of this information to you. Mm -hmm. And then post-job market for networking sort of with the folks that you were interacting with on the job market, I will say use your notes. So think about um, things that you wrote down while you were in your interview and if they become salient, especially if you like get the, the place that you get the job at, go back and look at your notes from your long interview there and see if there's anything that's like relevant for you to do in your first year, yeah. Um, when taking notes and when trying to ask like questions to be an active listener, how do you balance the right amount of detail? Because mm -hmm. we've spent the last few years getting very niche specific about a few things that they probably don't have context for, but they're also trained, so they probably have some input. So how do you avoid getting too far into the weeds? What's the right level of weeds to get into? So that is a good question. I think it depends the like topic that you're talking about. If it's a research topic and you're talking to someone who shares research like areas with you, like if you have research overlap, a very detailed question is not bad per se. You know, it like indicates um, that you have the ability to think carefully about something sort of on the spot. Um, if it's a more general question about the department or um, about the functioning of the university or something like this, you probably don't want to ask a super detailed question unless you feel like you really have the necessary context. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, so use your notes, refer back to them. You know, if, if when I interviewed for this job, I was like, hey, we don't seem like, like we have ORS, which Mark is running, but is that our department ag seminar? And now we've got like more ag and food people coming into our seminar. And that was something that was basically like, I asked a question about it. I took a note about it. And then I used my notes. 
and then I think that has worked out uh, okay. Um, and then I'm also going to say repeated exposure. So networking is not a one and done thing. It is a multi-step game. So the game theorists in the room will, I think, appreciate that you know each time you have an interaction with someone, it's an opportunity to update their priors about you and vice versa, um, so that you go through these sort of stages of the game um, and build your exposure to people, and that and that helps build your network. So that's job market. I'm going to now. Uh, See if I can fit beyond over here. I sort of overspilled my space, but so let's see. And beyond. So I think for the folks in the room who are not on the job market, you have an opportunity to start early at building your network and practice often. So this is not just, you're not just networking with people in order to go on the job market, right? You can build professional connections that will be useful to you among your peers. So your, your best network are actually the folks who are in this room right now. It's your peers at your PhD granting institution, particularly people um, who are in cohorts not too far away from you, right? They're going to be moving through the profession, the people who are two or three years ahead of you, whatever stage you're at, they have been through it relatively recently, right? So they can tell you, hey, um, this is what I did when I was putting together my first like review packet when the first year that I was on the tenure clock and I felt like I hadn't done anything because I'd only been in the job for three months. So like what the heck are you supposed to say when you have an annual review three months in? So they've been through that. They can be like, this is what I did. Here I can help you. Um, and the people who are a little behind you, you can serve that function to them. So you want to pay it forward, right? You don't want to just be taking from others um, because you want to put out positive energy into the world as well as sort of you know, consuming it. Um, so you can serve that function to other people, but then you're also going to get ideas from them and they're going to help build your, you know, people are all going somewhere. We don't know where we're all going, but we are all going somewhere. Um, so just because people are more junior than you doesn't mean that you shouldn't be building relationships with them, right? Those are really valuable people to build relationships with as well. Um, I'll also say like start small, don't put pressure on yourself to do big networking things, especially if they're scary to you for one reason or another. Um, so this could be like a regional conference or the Minnesota Economics Association Conference, which is this Friday, or going to lunch with a speaker, like these sort of smaller, lower stakes interactions give you a chance to practice. Um, find your own style, right? So we all have different ways of communicating and find a way of communicating that feels comfortable to you while still being sort of communicating what you want to communicate, that sort of positivity um, and, and making people excited about hanging out with you and, and having repeated future interactions with you. Um, so I said pay it forward and I'm going to say one other thing about that which is not just um, interacting with juniors but also sending positive feedback to people. So we all like receiving positive feedback. So if you read someone's paper and you think it's a cool paper, send them an email saying that, hey, you know, I saw your working paper get posted on Twitter or something, and I read it, and I thought it was super cool. I just wanted to write and let you know that I thought it was super cool. People love getting those kind of emails. That kind of email will like absolutely make your day. Or if it's like a student at another institution emails you and it's like, hey, I heard you're working on this. Like I'm working on this and your work in this area seems cool. I want to chat. Like those kind of emails make people's day, people's week, and will definitely get you remembered in their brain. So positive side effect for you is they remember who you are and have a positive association with it. Positive spillover is that there's like more good communication happening in the world. Um, I want to wrap this up so that we can get into um, the activities. Um, and so the last thing I'll say here is remember others' motivations.
and constraints. So as good economists, we can recognize that other people have constraints on their time, on their energy. You don't know what is happening with any particular person on any given day. So if they're grumpy, it almost certainly has nothing to do with you. So don't blame yourself for that or project something negative from your interaction onto that. Um, and also recognize you know, how much of people's time you can take up. So it's totally reasonable to ask to have coffee at a conference with a couple of people, but you don't want to be you know, consuming a lot, like so much of other people's time because everyone has constrained time. It's the only thing you can't really, I mean, you can buy time with money to some extent, but like we still only have 24 hours in a day. And then also remember other people's motivation. So if you can make yourself useful to people, um, try to help them notice how you can be useful to them because people are, are sort of self-centered and um, want to be, are often motivated by that. Um, I don't think that we should be too transaction-minded about this because this is something that I think networking has the power to do right, is to like move beyond the transactional and sort of create more than that. Um, so there's a balance here between being too transaction-minded and, and um, recognizing sort of the realities of people's um, incentives, but I think eventually you'll find a way to hit that balance. So I'm gonna pause here and say we'll do round one of Q&A if people have sort of questions on like general principles and things, and I'm gonna sit down. Um, so yeah, hit me with your questions. We've had a couple so far, but yeah, Becca. How do you solve the more? Um, so I think, so I am not good at social media. I think I'm much better in a room than I am online. I'm like solidly a lurker on Blue Sky and Twitter. So some people find this, that they can do this very effectively on the internet. And if that is your skill set, like cultivate that. Um, I think self-promotion uh, on the internet often looks like posting working papers or being saying, hey, uh, this news article came out, it's related to something that I'm working on. And I think it just sort of is like poking up your head. You're like a little mongoose poking your head up out of a hole and saying, hey, I'm here and this is what I'm working on. Um, if you get like a grant or something, it's posting about that on Twitter. Um, online, I think these, so that's what I think these things look like online. In person, I think what it looks like is when you meet someone and they say something that you have an accomplishment in that area or you have research in that area of saying, oh, it's so cool that you have a working paper on you know, the commodity food distribution program. I've actually done a lot of work on a related program. It'd be interesting to talk to you sometime about um, how you know, your work and my work might overlap or something like that. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, in the spirit of more general advice, um, I'm gonna say that it's one other thing I wanted to talk about just because I heard a horror story um, recently is um, sort of ground rules for alcohol consumption, which is that in some spaces, I probably don't need to tell anyone in this room this, but I'm gonna do a general disclaimer because it's top of mind right now, which is that in a lot of these contexts, right, it was like the dinner for the job, mar the dinner for the job market or the AAEA open reception thing, there is alcohol there and sometimes uh, people overconsume. And so, A, don't be the person who overconsumes. Be aware of like the number of alcoholic drinks you're consuming and space them with water. Um, and then B, if there is someone that is overconsuming, you don't want to be like associated with that person, especially not in a negative way. So try to help them take care of themselves, um, but don't be like dragged into that in a negative way. Um, and then be careful about volunteering for stuff. So volunteering for things like being on the grad student section at AAEA can definitely help to raise your profile, but there's a cost benefit with like time and how much it raises your profile. So just be aware of how much of a time suck it's going to be for you and how much you're going to get out of it and be careful because it can be really a lot easier to say yes to things than it is to say no to them. So let's talk about practicing stuff. So I am going to erase all of this now. So we're going to split up into groups and practice introducing ourselves to people. So um, I'm actually, I know I made you all already move, but I'm going to ask you to create 
groups of three or four, and I want the other people at your table to be people that you don't know very well. So it shouldn't be, um, for instance, the person that you're TAing for also at your table. <laughs> um, and then we're going to just practice giving intros. And I think the reason that I'm asking you to split up like this is that um, I want a slight disease. So um, if you're really comfortable with people, you won't feel that kind of like butterflies in your stomach that we often feel when we're introducing ourselves to strangers for the first time. <laughs> OK, so intros. You will not have a blackboard when you are introducing yourself to people for the first time. Um, but for now, I have this, I have a crutch that I can um, help you with. So in an introduction, suppose you are standing in, for those who have been to AAEA, you can visualize yourself in this hotel conference center the rooms that like they have all of the weird partitions and you're in this room and there's you know 40 chairs set up and a projector and maybe a whiteboard with you know one of these things um, and everyone is sort of milling about after the session so the session has just ended and there is uh, someone that you would like to introduce yourself to you know maybe they were one of the speakers or something like that so if you are introducing yourself to this person in this sort of context. Um, you should make sure in your introduction to include your name, obviously. Um, pronouns here, I think, uh, are not necessary unless they are important to you. Um, so if that is important to you because that is like, you want to make sure that people are including pronouns generally, um, but I think even in this sort of context, it's unlikely that um, pronouns are going to be used. So if you want to make sure that your name is associated with certain pronouns, I would say that you can use them, but probably better to be like wearing a button or something that indicates it without having to communicate it verbally. Um, so that is sort of my take on pronouns here. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, you can say sort of I'm a third year, second year, whatever, at whatever department, at whatever university. And then if you are a job market candidate, strike year and replace this with job market candidate. So one way that you do self-promotion to answer Becca's question is that if you're on the job market, tell people you're on the job market so that they can know that if they have a job, they can tell you, hey, apply for our job. Um, and then, very broadly, what area you study. Okay, so now we're going to take mm, five minutes. We'll probably just hear when things die down and um, practice this in our groups. Yeah, right. Before we start, there was a Q and A that was on Zoom. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, it's not your fault. It's fine. Uh, Francis asks, "What questions can be a good start for?" conversations with a speaker, suppose you meet someone on a conference. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's pretty common to just lean on the material in their talk. So this sort of goes back to Tom's question about like how detailed can you be? And I think with someone who's just given a 15 minute talk at AAEA, there's almost certainly like those 15 minute talks are so condensed that it's really easy to ask follow-up questions because there's a lot of stuff that they will have had to cut to fit into the talk. So if it's like, oh, I didn't catch, um, you know, what level you aggregated the data at. And, you know, it's better if this is a question that you have a genuine answer in, but it doesn't have to be necessarily. Um, so I think something based on the talk is really great um, if you have a question about how they got started working on this paper, like how did the idea for this paper come about, um, how did you get access to the data? Um, do you have any related work on X topic that is related topic? I think those are sort of the like broad strokes. Hopefully that answered Francis's question. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, actually, I actually had, we have time for it. Yeah. 
was, so I found that in certain settings, there's a very popular person, right? They're, they have an exciting Yeah, person. and there's like a queue waiting to talk right. to them. And so I was wondering, do you have a strategy where like, you didn't email them ahead of time to get like a one-on-one -on -one coffee for like 10 minutes, but do you have a strategy where after the talk, you're like, hey, you know, I'm Ryan, I'd really love to talk, blah, 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 we have a connection here, can we chat for 10 minutes like tomorrow during that session? Is, is there a way that you get out of the queue, is what I'm getting at? Oh, so I think to say what you said, you'd want to stay in the queue because you okay. don't want to like cut. Um, it's an odd phenomenon, um, and it feels a little absurd if you're just like watching it from afar, because um, it feels sort of religion-y. Um, I think you can email people, honestly, say, really enjoyed your talk, notice that we have this overlap, do you have any time later in the conference for a coffee? So that's the way that you cut the queue, is you type an email on your phone in the room. Got it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, but otherwise, to like say that in person, I think you would need to, to stand there. Yeah. OK, so um, using this sort of broad framework, take like until what it says 35 on there um, to go around your group and introduce yourselves to each other. OK. Have, has anyone not done their introduction? Great. Um, does anyone have like things that they noticed from people in their group's introductions that um, seem sort of like common pitfalls here? Or things that someone in your group did really well that you thought was like a good idea? Anything stand out either positively or constructively? Yeah, Tom. Uh, name dropping, if there's like a particular estimator or like a particular tool you're using, you don't have to get into the weeds about it, but like having just some flag about a thing that you have done to kind of put some more meat on the bones of the conversation mm -hmm. gives a great like jumping off point, because then I could be like, oh, hey, I use that estimator too. Oh, hey, what would, how did you solve this problem? And it can like lead to follow-ups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just so positive is like seeing a mutual interest and like elaborating on where that intersects. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, both of your comments sort of highlight the fact that this introduction should be the start to a conversation and not the end of the road, right? So you want to. You know, if you're the first person to introduce yourself, you want to kind of like lead some threads open that someone else can pull on and say, this is the path that I want to go down. Um, or if you're the second person to go like, oh, you know, like, hi, I'm Charlotte. You mentioned that you like to cross country ski. I also like to cross country ski. I live in Minnesota, and so that's a super common thing, something like that. Um, so the broad strokes are there, but obviously make it your own. Don't get too detailed, but without getting too detailed, maybe you can leave some threads open for other people to pull on. OK, great. Um, so the next common thing, so beyond the intro, the intro is like max 20 to 30 seconds, something like that. Um, and that is sort of like, it's the start of a conversation. In a more formal setting, or if you are so in a short interview or a long interview, or if you are meeting with someone while you're a job market candidate at AAEA, um, they may say, tell me about your research. And that is like, if you hear that question for the first time, you may have exactly that reaction where you go, oh crud, I don't know what to say here because all of, the thought, all of these thoughts are swirling in my brain. Um, so how do you answer, tell me about your research? The answer to that is your elevator pitch. So this is your summary between 30 seconds and two to five minutes of yourself as a researcher. Um, and I like to sort of think of this, I drew a very bad inverted triangle here um, as going from the top of the inverted triangle, which is the broad strokes, and then it progressively narrows. So you will have basically equivalent timing cutoffs to this elevator pitch, where maybe this is 30 seconds, and then uh, this is you know, a minute, and then this is 
like three minutes of talking. And the idea is that if you start with the like very broad strokes, even if someone cuts you off or asks a follow-up question, which is what you want, right? You want people to ask a question so that you can then start a conversation. Um, you want them to get the broad strokes of what you have worked on so far. And when you're on the job market, this will be mostly about your job market paper. You'll notice that one of the, uh, what I call off ramps from this inverted triangle is your other research. So those are the other chapters of your dissertation or anything else that you have done research wise. Um, but basically you want to say, get to the like essentials first. So I am an applied microeconomist that studies food and nutrition in the context of households interacting with food retailers. My job market paper looks at the effect of the disqualification of WIC uh, vendors on the participation of people who use WIC and the amount of benefits that they redeem. I find that a disqualification of a WIC vendor reduces participation by about 40%, but has no meaningful effect on the quantity of WIC benefits that people redeem. And then I use administrative data from the California blah, 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 right? So you can see it's been two years since I was on the job market and I can still like more or less cobble this together because it should be pretty second nature to you by the time that you are doing your short interviews with people. So the 32nd thing is describing yourself as an economist. So most people in this room are probably applied microeconomists, but you could be a macroeconomist. You could say I'm a labor economist if you want to be more specific than applied microeconomist. Um, however you think of yourself as an economist from general to more specific. And I study sort of your areas. So if you're in, you know, I study the environment, I study uh, resource allocation, whatever it is that you study. Job market paper looks at the effect of X on Y is the general format. If your job market paper doesn't fall into the general format of looking at the effect of X on Y, you can think of another sort of succinct way of describing what it does. You know, it develops a theory for estimating uh, difference in difference with staggered adoption if you're an econometrician, for example. Um, your findings, summarized briefly. Um, the data that you use, the method that you use, right? You can tell we're really getting down into the weeds here and then sort of the, the motivation. Um, and then you're, that'll probably get you solidly up to the three or five minute mark. And then your off ramps where if you've gotten to this point and they haven't interrupted you, you're dying to stop talking at this point. So you're gonna say, you know, uh, the reason that this is important is that, you know, we've designed a safety net where public uh, you know, participants in public assistance programs have to interact with private firms, and this fits into my broader body of research that looks at the general interplay between public food assistance programs and private firms, which I would be happy to talk about if you have any other questions, and that gives you a stopping point. Or you can say, like, this has these policy implications. If you want to hear more about how this work can inform policy, I'd be happy to talk about that or the robustness, or whether you have, if you have like an extension work that you've done or outreach work that you've done. So all of these are the off ramps here so that you can finally stop talking. But at that point, you will have covered the basics of your research. So um, for folks who um, have this spiel, um, you can sort of generally sketch the outline of it now and maybe if this framework is appealing to you to think about, you could restructure it if you want to align it more with this. For those who don't have their spiel, um, you can take five minutes to sketch some notes to yourself about this. Um, and then we will go around in our groups and give each other spiels. So take until, we'll probably need 10 minutes to do this all in our groups. So take until like at least Take five minutes to do this, like writing notes to yourself sort of thing, um, and then go around in your group and practice, and you can give each other feedback. So say one thing that I thought you did that was really great, if you want like a general feedback structure, right, is one constructive thing and one positive thing, and maybe you could do the positive one second so that you don't end on a sour note. Um, so yeah, that should take you through to basically the end, and we'll try to leave two minutes at the end for questions. And flag me if you're having trouble with this. Okay, um, I'm gonna let you guys do this after we've wrapped up. I just wanted to say if there was any final 
question and answer. Hopefully this was helpful. Ryan has a question. There was one that we had in our table earlier. That is a general question of when you're at conferences, often you want to network with some people, but they're already having kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. There's always that awkward moment when you walk in and you kind of silently just stand there <laughs> and wait your turn to be a part of the group. Yeah. And we were wondering if you had any professional advice on how to be less awkward versions of yourself. Um, I have no advice on how to be a less awkward version of myself. I only know how to be the maximally awkward version of myself. Um, so the circle thing is odd, right? And it, so hopefully they will open the circle to you. Then this is part of like what we do when we pay it forward is that like if you see someone who seems like they want to enter your circle, you like be like, oh, come join us. And then if someone inside the circle invites you in, it is automatically much less awkward. Um, so what we hope is that people open the circle. If no one opens the circle for you, then you are definitely entitled to like enter that space yourself. If you know someone in the circle, you can kind of give them a little wave and then maybe they will like create a space for you. Um, but no, it's an awkward thing. Those are my like two best tips. Um, but uh, yeah, it's an awkward thing. Okay, yeah, so if you have a class, go. Um, I will stick around. Thanks everyone, hopefully this was helpful. Thanks Ryan for coordinating.